Welcome to Harbinger's flagship interactive webinar, Power Hour. Ensure you have selected the right speaker for audio output. Test your speaker to ensure it is working fine from the audio settings option on the lower left corner of your screen. If necessary, dial in using phone. Let's tune in. Hello everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for this interesting panel discussion on the topic, how generative AI is transforming teaching in higher education space. So I'll quickly introduce myself. My name is Rahul. I work as a senior director for EdTech line of business at Harbinger Group, and I will be your host for today. We want this to be an interactive panel discussion. So of course, you'll get to hear from our esteemed panelists, but at the same time, at any point of time, if you have any views, thoughts, or questions, please feel free to type in the chat box, and we will be happy to take them up with our panelists for discussion. And with that, let me, please allow me to introduce you to our first panelist for today. We have Avinash Lele, Avi on the call with us. Good morning, Avi. Thank you very much for joining us today for this conversation. Thank you, Rahul, for having me. Uh, very excited to be uh, on the panel uh, discussing something that is topical, uh, disruptive, uh, game-changing, frankly. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, absolutely. Game changing is the yeah. word, Avi. So, Avi, uh, yeah. could you please talk a little bit about yourself for the audience to know you a little better? Sure thing. Uh, so, uh, my name is Avinash Lele. As, as you can see, I'm uh, known as Avi uh, amongst friends and colleagues. Uh, have been in IT services uh, for most of my uh, professional life. Uh, was uh, lucky to uh, run a couple of uh, uh, companies. Uh, as uh, as its CEO, uh, and uh, uh, delighted to be a part of um, Harbinger Group, where uh, my responsibilities are uh, uh, to drive uh, strategy, uh, direction, and growth. Uh, and uh, very excited, like I said, uh, to uh, to be a part of this uh, conversation. Rahul. Thank you. Thank you once again, Avi. And uh, we are really, again, uh, we are excited to have you on the panel, I think. Uh, from a business leader like you, we will be. It will be very, very interesting to know that what does this disruption or this game-changing thing looks like from a thirty thousand feet overview, also at the ground level, uh, because you know you've been there and seen that. So uh, thank you again. So let me uh, take an opportunity to uh, welcome our second panelist for the day today. We have Michael on the call with us. Michael Spencer. Good morning, Michael. How are you doing today? Good morning, everyone. Rahul, thank you. Michael, uh, could you please talk a little bit about yourself in terms of what you do, uh, uh, just for the audience to know you a little better? Sure. First of all, I'd like to thank you again for inviting me to the panel. Uh, always an honor to be part of the uh, you know EdTech Power or Harbinger sure. panel groups. Uh, in, in brief, Global Expansion Strategies is a global growth advisory and investment firm. We work with education companies to help them expand globally, uh, to basically take their technologies out there outside their existing boundaries and or countries. Um, we've found tremendous benefit um, in, in doing so because it really allows um, for international education institutions to leverage the technologies that are developed in other parts of the world. Um, one of the unique challenges we do experience with these education companies is that the, because the growth is so aggressive um, in their early years of expansion, uh, we have the means to uh, invest in them to help finance that growth. We all know that there are a lot of ed tech companies out there that have tremendous technology, tremendous potential, but lack the capital and resources to do so. So uh, GC, GE Global Expansion Strategies helps in, in all facets of their global growth. By ways of myself, uh, born and raised overseas, born in Africa, lived in several countries throughout the Middle East, Southeast Asia, Europe, uh, spending most of my teens in Latin America. So the D the international DNA gene is uh, part of part of who I am. Well, thank you, thank you, Michael, once again uh, for uh, joining us for this conversation. 
I think you rightly pointed about the topic growth in terms of uh, in the early years of startups, uh, the aggressive growth that they look forward for, and they might not have the resources and capabilities. Mm -hmm. And that's where, you know, a disruptive technology like AI can also kind of augment their growth strategy and all. So, of course, we'll talk about that more in detail. Mm -hmm. We'll kind of pick your brains on that. So, uh, definitely, uh, that would be very interesting. And now, please allow me to introduce our third panelist for the day. We have Dr. Kim William Gordon in the room with us. Good morning, Kim. How are you doing today? Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. You know, that you just caused me to remember an article I read just recently in which someone was trying to figure out how we're going to be able to synchronize these type of conferences when we have folks on the moon and Mars and the time zone alone thing is going to be problematic. <laughs> they are. Yeah, it, it's going to be an interesting couple of decades, I think. Uh, I'm, I'm Kim Gordon. I have uh, with the EdTech Research Company, uh, EdTech Research Labs. We're a research firm. We're focused almost exclusively on the impact of uh, artificial intelligence, augmented adaptive learning on both the education sector and the learning and development sector. Uh, and I'll pause there for a second and just simply say that uh, sometimes they tend to blur together <laughs> from my perspective. Uh, we are really concerned about uh, retention, uh, which AI provides us the opportunity to begin to measure. And one of our signature concerns is something called knowledge mapping. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about knowledge mapping, uh, even within the next 18 months, as it emerges to be a very powerful tool in understanding each individual's abilities, propensities, capabilities, I could continue. Uh, my, uh, I'm gonna put my LinkedIn in the chat box here. I like new friends. I certainly like new friends who are all talking about this stuff. Uh, my background, when you take a look at my profile, is an eclectic mix. I've been in the corporate sector. I've been in the bid, biz, excuse me, big corporate sector, IBM, AT&T. Uh, owned a couple of little startups myself. Was involved with a number of startups. And then I made the drastic error of spending almost five years as a dean at a local <laughs> university until I realized I had no business being there. Uh, so anyway, I look forward to uh, this conversation because the topic is hot. And as I mentioned uh, in our preliminary meeting prior to this conference, is that from my view, it's about time that we're starting to talk about these things. Absolutely, Kim. And uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. I mean, listening to you would be very interesting because you've been doing some, uh, you know, good stuff in terms of in terms of research in the AI space. And, uh, you know, the point that you mentioned about knowledge mapping, that's going to be interesting. So, of course, in our conversation further, we'll talk about that more in detail. So, with that, uh, once again, a thank you to all the panelists for joining us for today. So, let's kind of uh, take a deep dive into our conversation and let's see that, you know, what's our game plan for today? So, primarily, you know, it's, it's definitely a very vast topic with, you know, uh, a variety of opinions around it, but we will try and keep uh, focused on these four topics uh, for today's context. First is, uh, of course, we don't need to kind of uh, drill down on this, but just to set the context, need opportunities and future of generative AI in teaching. Then second is how generative AI is going to help with the personalized learning and learning reinforcement. Knowledge retention is a big challenge. We can create a lot of content, we can do a lot of teaching, but how do we ensure knowledge retention? The third is how to implement generative AI-based content curation and assessment creation. These are kind of just a couple of use cases. The idea is how we can leverage generative AI to free up time for faculties uh, from administrative tasks so that they can spend more time, quality time with students uh, in teaching them and interacting with them. And then last one is how to use generative AI for knowledge discovery and virtual teaching assistance. Probably that's where we'll uh, you know, turn to Kim and talk about that knowledge mapping theory a little bit more. So this is basically our game plan for today. All right, so as Kim mentioned, it's about time. So the shift has started happening. And uh, a few years back, Larry Page, uh, the co-founder of Google, he had made the statement, 
And uh, I feel it's very relevant in today's context, in today's uh, conversation. He said that artificial intelligence would be the ultimate version of Google or the best possible search engine that would have knowledge about almost everything and anything. And, you know, probably we are not there yet, but we are making the incremental steps to reach there. And sooner or later, uh, we will all continue to working towards to reach there. Also from a business perspective, and uh, I think uh, this is a stat that is uh, there in the industry that AI in the education market specifically is expected to grow from approximately 2 billion in 2022 to more than 25 billion in 2030, with North America accounting for the largest share. I mean, just look at the exponential growth that's happening in you know just a period of time of eight years. So that's the kind of shift that we are looking at or talking about. Now, <clears throat> now we can say that you know there are a lot of things that generative AI can do or can be leveraged uh, in reshaping most of the activities that we do in the education space. What we have done is we have broadly classified that into four different categories. Uh, the first one is administrative support. So in these U.S. higher education system or in the higher education system globally, enrollments is a big challenge. Uh, you know, colleges are shutting down or they are not uh, performing to their optimum levels just because the enrollments are not happening. So this is one area where, you know, in the administrative support part, the enrollments, the admissions part, that's where generative AI can play a role. Then, of course, the teaching support is big one, and that's where we are going to focus on in our conversation today as to how generative AI can free up time for faculties. Learning support, when the learner is in the journey, in the learning journey process, whether they are in the classroom or they are doing self-paced learning or they are doing learning with peers, how can like a, you know, AI-enabled virtual coach or a tutor can play a role? In fact, uh, this is where I wanted to call out an interesting story from Georgia Tech University. This is about you know year 2020 when pandemic had hit across the globe. Uh, Georgia Tech University implemented an AI-enabled professor and they called it uh, Jill Watson. So the students would virtually interact uh, you know, with this professor, Jill Watson. And, you know, they never realized that it's a AI enabled professor. So at the end of their semester, they said that, you know, can we meet Jill Watson? Uh, we like the professor. We want to have a meeting with that person. Then Georgia Tech told them that, guys, listen, that's not a human professor. That's an AI enabled professor. So we have, we have moved far away from that Jill Watson story, but that was, uh, you know, something interesting that happened some time back. And the next one is research support. I think that's big. Living in the present is, you know, how we can correct the administrative support, the teaching support, and the learning support. That's kind of the present things. But how do we prepare ourselves for future? So that's where how we can, you know, shift through tons of data and make sense out of it and help faculties, instructors, teachers do more of research and make the education or the content, the learning content more and more viable for the future needs. So that's kind of, you know, broadly four categories of generative AI. Of course, there could be more. If there's something that comes to your mind in the audience, please uh, feel free to type in the chat section. We'll be happy to talk about that as well. So moving ahead in terms of focusing on the teaching support part, I think uh, my first question to would be to Avi. So Avi, basically, I wanted to kind of request you to talk a little bit about what Harbinger is doing in the generative AI domain to enable faculties uh, spend more time on teaching and interacting with students? Sure thing, uh, Rahul. So let me start off by saying that Harbinger over its entire existence has been focused on enhancing learning experience through the le uh, use of technology. So technology and learning are close to our hearts uh, and they guide uh, our vision uh, from a growth perspective. Uh, my definition of learning is the development, delivery, reception, uh, internalizing and application of meaningful content. So it's, it's about how do we uh, work with content? And it is in that realm that Harbinger has come out with 
uh, eye content, which is uh, its intelligence automation framework, which is fundamentally uh, an automation workbench that through the use of APIs delivers capabilities like parsing, tagging, video skimming, uh, translating, which is a uh, big benefit and a big need uh, for, uh, for educators uh, and transcribing, uh, not to mention uh, uh, you know, accessibility checking and the generation of questions. So all of these uh, capabilities help in either efficiency or superior delivery uh, or in uh, the way uh, the content is, is understood. So, uh, and the, the great thing about uh, the, the, the framework, the automation framework is that it uh, is uh, uh, based on fine-tuned uh, AI models like uh, BERT, GPT-2, and D5. In fact, this, uh, this pursuit has been going on at Harbinger for over a decade. And the latest uh, uh, sort of underpinning uh, is on uh, GPT-4. So uh, fundamentally, uh, you know, we are looking uh, to, to work on uh, content delivery uh, and content operations like creating, managing, uh, delivering and analyzing content. That's really uh, uh, where we are focused on. Uh, accuracy, speed, productivity, efficiency are all the big benefits that they get as a result of the use of this particular framework. Uh, we've gotten great reception. Uh, we're hoping to sort of uh, work with our uh, partners, customers and prospects in, uh, in helping them integrate this AI-based uh, approach uh, to greater productivity and greater uh, business uh, and educational outcomes uh, going forward, Rahul. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. This is very interesting. I think uh, you rightly mentioned some of the features that you uh, called about the eye content framework. They're going to make the lives easier for faculties and teachers. And uh, especially like those words that you called out, accuracy and speed, that's, that's kind of the name of the game that uh, you need to do things fast and you need to get it correct at the first time itself. And that's where if something like this can be leveraged by the faculties and teachers that will make their lives a lot more easier. Thank you. We will we'll come back to you again uh, in the round of discussion. So we'll sure. move to the second question and that's kind of for Michael. So Michael, uh, how are some of your portfolio companies uh, leveraging this technology shift around <clears throat> AI to overall improve the teaching and learning experience? Sure, Rahul, great, great question. Um, almost all the companies in our portfolios in, in our portfolio incorporate some form of, of AI. I, I would say across the portfolio, the unique and benefits of, of AI is that it truly allows the, the technologies and the platforms to assess current student learning uh, trajectory or disabilities, but more importantly, sub, uh, prescribe and diagnose the learning outcomes optimum for that one specific student. So the technology is really adaptive in the sense that it allows for instructors at the school to have a technology that can um, diagnose and subsequently prescribe um, individualized learning plans for those students, right? Um, it takes a tremendous burden off of the uh, institution and it puts it in the hands of AI. I, I would say parallel to that, um, the pandemic really implemented a transitional shift in teaching online. Everybody scrambled um, to deploy some sort of online learning. You roll forward two years, schools are coming back, students are going back into school, but what's happening? Schools or education institutions are, are really seeing the true power of AI in that it allows them to continue to work with these students online instead of having the students come back to school. So it's really reinforced that shift to keeping the students online, should they decide to do that, um, and continue to give those students uh, individual learning plans. So we've seen benefits both from the, the technology as well as the instructional model at the school, as well as the, the individual students themselves. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. That's interesting. I think uh, the point that you mentioned about uh, 
diagnosing the learning outcomes for the individual students. So that's that's very important. And I think that's kind of alluding towards the question that we have for Kim. And of course, uh, we'll, we'll get to that question. But I think uh, one of the important aspects is that when you have a classroom of students or you, if you have a batch of students, it's humanly, it's not possible for every instructor or teacher to give attention to every individual. And at times, if technology can be leveraged to figure out who are the at-risk students, and that risk could be because of multiple things. Maybe the course or the curriculum that they are enrolled to, they are not engaged to that subject. Maybe it's not of their liking, or it could be even a financial stress because of uh, tuition debts, uh, they might be at risk. So flagging out those risks and working out an individualized plan for those students, that's that's interesting. And thank you very much for calling that out, Michael. Yeah, I mean it's it's and it's not only a, it's not only for students that may have learning disabilities, but it allows these education institutions to truly provide um, individual learning paths for their for those students that perhaps don't want to come to school or or have some sort of ability not to and be able to continue their education online. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So, so Kim, uh, we wanted to kind of ask you that, uh, how do you think generative AI can foster research in the higher education space? And I know you have a couple of slides to present, so I'll stop sharing the so that you can share your screen. All righty, you got it. Everybody got me here? Yes, you can see your screen. All right, so um, what's happening is that as the brainstorming commences, the ways that AI can impact not only education space, but once again, the training and learning and development space, but society at large. And so I can't overemphasize how much power we've just unleashed as a human species uh, upon ourselves. And uh, I'm very pleased to see that we're finally moving past some of the industrial age thinking and finally getting into some thinking that is going to hopefully take us to Mars and Titan and Venus and wherever else we go. Uh, I just have a couple, a list here. You know, certainly as a research assistant, uh, I've been experimenting with a number of different models and what these systems can deliver back to me in seconds uh, would have taken me hours, sometimes days. Maybe I would have never bumped into some of the information that the AI is providing me that I can digest and then utilize uh, accordingly. Certainly as a teacher's assistant, and we'll talk more about that towards the end of the seminar today about how the teaching assistants uh, really re-engineer what we think of as a classroom environment. In fact, I'm predicting the classroom as we know it will, if not morph, will completely disappear, uh, certainly as a learner's tutor. And let's think about what that means. You know, once again, these systems are awake 24 hours a day, right? So a learner does not necessarily need to be in a classroom environment in order to satisfy perhaps some of their curiosity. And the system can be there constantly supporting them in their acquisition of new knowledge, new ideas, new thoughts, new thinking. Certainly providing synopsis of literature review. I'll talk about that in uh, the next slide regarding some of our barriers because this is a very powerful component, but we've got some barriers right now that uh, I'll, uh, I'll ask the audience at large towards the end of the session of what they've discovered, if anything, to resolve it. Uh, certainly brainstorming. So I've gotten in the habit recently of just what if, <laughs> and it's amazing some of the answers that I'm getting. Uh, some of them could be quite interesting to us uh, once again as a human race, and it could also be uh, pretty interesting to the AI and the way that it augments our society. Uh, predictive analytics, uh, th that's a given. Uh, the, the system can take a look at a wide variety of data and start dishing back different ways to look at it, uh, including one of those I mentioned previously, and I once again talk about that in a moment, uh, the whole knowledge mapping issue, as well as knowledge mapping has its uh, direct connection to retention. 
retention analysis. One of the things that I've been advocating for years is it's all well and good to sit somebody through a classroom. How do we know they got it enough that they retain it a year from now, six weeks from now, whatever it may be. Uh, and certainly a, the era of personalized learning is finally here. And what these systems are, especially in the area of adaptive learning technology, begin to do is understand the learner better than they know themselves. They begin to understand what that particular learner's uh, abilities are, their propensity to learn, what time of day do they learn, how they, they like to learn, what topics do they like that might be able to interconnect with their learning environment. Uh, the, the potential is just dumbfounding, actually, in many ways. And then uh, certainly in simulations, back to uh, brainstorming, give me a simulation of the what if scenario that we just dreamt up. We have issues, right? And all issues can be confronted. We can, we can solve all these. One of the concerns that I have regarding the general application of uh, ChatGPT in particular is that you know most of the real research is hidden behind paywall walls or some uh, security wall. Uh, for instance, Reed Elsevier is a remarkable scientific uh, uh, system of, of journals and research literature, uh, as well as uh, just a number of different uh, analysis that we can't get to. And so the last I checked, uh, folks like uh, Reed Elsevier or even ProQuest, where most of the dissertations are uh, sitting, uh, I do not see any activity so far, and this is where I'm really interested in what other folks are seeing, in them opening up those paywalls in some way so that the AI can reach into them and actually start pulling out some validated research. Curation. Uh, we, we really haven't defined what the human curation component of all of this needs to be, but it has to be there. And so I've seen a number of different models where that curation is being uh, applied, but uh, we haven't, I don't think, and once again, I'm really interested in what everybody else has to see at this point. Uh, we haven't seen to have identified a curation model, if you will, uh, that can be used in a variety of applications that can be validated, right? We need to have some regimen and some academic excellence and some training ex excellence in these systems. Validation. How do we know this stuff is real? You know, we've all heard the stories about the AI going crazy. Uh, I guess I would have gone crazy too. It's a, a care and feeding thing, right? What, what are we feeding this AI? And is it uh, really interpreting? Uh, does it have the tools and the mechanisms necessary for it to be kind of understanding what's real, what's not real. I mean, let's face it, folks, there's a lot of disinformation out there. Uh, you know, we have a problem with the status quo. Uh, there, there is a contingent still very strong and embedded that believe that the traditional classroom environment is viable. Um, I personally don't believe that. I don't think the traditional classroom has been viable for 50 years. And if you want to talk more about that, I'd love to. Uh, and then, you know, the Bloom's Two Sigma problem. If you're not familiar with that research conducted by Benjamin Bloom uh, in the mid 80s, uh, I would go back and look at it. And the problem said that uh, if we really want to train and educate learners, we need to allow two things. First of all, we've got to eliminate grades and then we've got to eliminate timelines. And that's what this study addresses. Elimination of grading will take us a long way there, but what do you replace it with? Bloom said mastery. So this is where I like to emphasize that there is a tremendous amount of research that's been conducted for the last 40 years that's really just been waiting for where we're at right now. And then the learner becomes more independent. Uh, they can pursue those strange thoughts they have about topics that perhaps may or may not be of interest to them. Uh, there are no constraints. We don't have textbooks. We don't have any of those constraints anymore. We have a true learner-centric uh, arena in which um, they can uh, chase their curiosity. And I think, I hope, and I'm working very hard to re-establish the simple love of learning. I think uh, we've lost a lot of that and it's time that we get back to it. That's what we're, we are good at. And I'm saying we as a global species. Uh, all right, so 
let me return the screen to you. Let me push some buttons here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, this was very interesting. I think uh, if given an opportunity, I would certainly want elimination of grading and hopefully it would have happened uh, during my college days. But maybe the next generations, the Gen Alphas, uh, they can enjoy this. Uh, there's, uh, you know, uh, the point that you mentioned about brainstorming, that's pretty interesting. Uh, Jonathan in the audience also believes, uh, you know, feels that, you know, brainstorming is a very interesting aspect. Otherwise, you'll have to find a colleague or a peer or a, a subordinate or someone and, you know, you have to do whiteboarding and talk with that guy, whether that individual is interested in, in, in it or not. But, you know, right. yeah, you can can kind of solve that problem. So it's time that, uh, you know, we take a look at some of the chats, uh, comments, and some of the questions. There's some interesting comments coming in from the audience. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Yep, Jonathan says, uh, best of all, AI does not judge you while brainstorming. So that's kind of the beauty. And yes, of course, we totally <laughs> agree. Yeah, I can tell you that from personal experience. I've been asking it some harebrained stuff. <laughs> Is it? Yeah. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah. Uh, Sandra said, uh, "Wow, I am amazed. They could tell it was an AI. They couldn't tell it was an AI generated teacher. What does that mean for the future of faculty?" So, this is, I think, uh, kind of tied to the Georgia Tech case. See, uh, and of course, our panelists will talk about it. It's it's not here to replace the faculties. It's just there to augment. Uh, you know, make things easier for them, make them more productive, make them more efficient. Elisa has asked a question, is there a link to the handouts? Yes, absolutely. After the webinar, you'll get a recording of the uh, uh, the webinar. And uh, I think all the panelists have posted their LinkedIn uh, profiles in the chat. Feel Please feel free to connect with them. I've got a comment about the role of faculty, the role of teachers. And many teachers that I know personally, the reason they've got into education or training is because a number of things. They want to make a difference. They want to enthuse. They want to inspire. They want to excite. They want to motivate. And all of those words that I just use have nothing to do with the specific silo of topic. And so I think in many ways, what these technologies will begin to allow is for those teachers to go back to what humans are good at. And, and we can excite people to just want to know more and then let the machine do the heavy lifting, shovel the coal, if you will. And so the <laughs> role of the teacher, I don't believe will ever go away. I think it will collapse back to what they wanted to do in the first place. And if you take that and you think about it uh, predictively, at some point we all become teachers, right? 20 years from now, 30 years from now. Yeah. It, 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 so once again, I can't overemphasize the impact that these technologies will have. Look at what they've already done. Will have yeah. is going to be fun. Rah Rahul, I have Matt. If I can give an example. Uh, we, we recently, one of the solutions in our portfolio is an, is an English language platform. One of the questions specifically posted in the chat was, how do they see uh, AI being used in, in teaching students overseas English? Um, one of our lar very large school operators with several hundreds of thousands of students was struggling to teach their students how to read, write, and speak, specifically in K-12. We deployed the technology backed by AI, and within the course of nine to 12 months, we started to see that students were making tremendous progress in their read, write, and speaking capabilities, and those that were struggling were being implemented in what we see now as a flipped classroom model. To the tune to where um, they discovered roughly 15% of the students were in a flipped classroom model, while the rest were able to continue along their uh, English language learning course um, without an instructor. So we were able to demonstrate that AI supported those students to be able to uh, continue in their self-guided, self-paced instruction. And those that struggled could use the flipped classroom, have one-on-one -on -one instructions with the teacher, um, get their remediation and continue on. That wouldn't have happened without AI. Absolutely, Michael. And, and thank you. Thank you very much for uh, giving this example. It kind of answers that question. Uh, there's, there's a question from Prachi. It says that what part did students enjoy while interacting with an AI teacher? 
considering human nature, which prefers personal contact? Uh, very valid question. I think this is where the shift is happening from those you know, standard bots, which will ask you canned questions. Uh, and But now in, 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 in case of Georgia Tech or some of the other virtual teachers or faculties that are being implemented, there is also a thing called sentiment and intent analysis. The way we type back, the way the kind of words that we use while interacting with those virtual chatbots, they kind of uh, build a you know portfolio for an individual learner, which includes the sentiment and intent part. You cannot get it right without the sentiment and intent part. You know, other than that, it's just as good as a PDF document, which is giving you some information. So it has to be a blend of that. And of course, as as Kim said, that of course it's not there to replace, but it's there just to augment. And I suspect because some of the uh, studies that we've been conducting, there is a very personal aspect to the AI, right? Because it is responding to that learner one on one, and so we haven't eliminated that direct communication with the student. In fact, it's probably better than a poor instructor who's saddled with 30 or 40 students in their classroom, right? So in that context, you can actually marry the best of both worlds, the instructor and the AI's ability to drill into that particular student's wants, needs, desires, and then have a real cooperative session between the AI and the teacher. So I, I wouldn't think in any way, shape, or form, once again, we're going to replace teachers. We're just going to let them do what they're really good at. Right, absolutely. Yeah. And sure. thank you. Thank you very much, everyone in the audience, for sharing your comments and thoughts. And yeah, Avi, you wanted to kind of share your thoughts. No, no, I, I was just uh, uh, agreeing with Kim. I mean, just to, uh, he had a, a bullet point on, uh, you know, how to uh, make sense of uh, the literature out there. Uh, the Here is another little. Uh, nugget uh, from an AI perspective that AI has made its way into Nobel Prize winning literature. So uh, those of you who like uh, uh, Kazuo uh, Ishiguro, whose uh, movies have been made, uh, uh, I mean, books have been made into great movies. His latest uh, uh, one was Clara and the Sun, where the AI buddy, uh, and he studied AI for almost five years before he wrote this. Uh, so uh, my uh, my sense is that we will only be limited by our imagination in how AI is actually going to be put to use. Frankly, it's 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 that that vast and that big. And I highly recommend that book. By the way, uh, it's it's brilliantly written. So, thank you for a little uh, AI nugget for you. Yeah, thank you. That, that's that's very interesting. And of course, it's it's beyond imagination as to how AI will change our lives. And uh, I think uh, Alexander has asked a question and that kind of uh, dry is driving to the next question that I have for Avi. So the question is, as the AI market grows, what are some of the products that you see the most significant demand from educators and students? Uh, for example, Khan Academy, yes, they've launched the AI tutor kind of concept. So actually uh, my next question to Avi was, Avi, uh, you, were there at the InstructureCon event recently, which was held at Denver. So uh, would it be possible for you to share some of the experiences uh, or the conversations sure. you had uh, while interacting with the higher ed stakeholders? Sure thing. Uh, firstly, uh, this uh, InstructureCon uh, was back uh, uh, as an in-person event. So there was a lot of excitement just to be with each other. So uh, right there, there was uh, excitement, but the buzz was uh, enhanced even further because uh, Gen AI and ChatGPT were at the center of uh, the entire conversation. Uh, and uh, the, the big thing that got discussed really was around how do we, how do we um, reach uh, or, or, or uh, promote responsible AI? Because teaching has responsibilities. I mean, it's, it's not just the eager uh, adoption uh, or integration of uh, new technologies and, and, and disruptions. It is how to do everything in a, in a responsible fashion. So that was a big part of uh, what, ha uh, what was discussed uh, uh, in Denver. Of course, uh, there was a brand new feature uh, called new quizzes, which is now part of Canvas, which is uh, 
Instructures Learning Management uh, uh, System. Uh, we got a chance to uh, demonstrate uh, Harbinger's own uh, product called Quillions, which is really uh, the world's first AI powered platform for creating questions, quizzes, and notes. Uh, it's powered by uh, AI and ML algorithms. And it's a platform that lets you build a host of quality questions uh, and assessments. That got uh, uh, significant uh, sort of uh, interest. We uh, spoke to almost uh, 75 uh, uh, institutions, K to 12 uh, and, uh, uh, and higher ed. I, I spoke to University of Michigan, Virginia, uh, uh, University of uh, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, we've already started talking about how, uh, uh, you know, uh, Quillians can be used. It's already integrated, by the way, uh, with Canvas. So uh, those who use uh, Canvas as an LMS uh, can, uh, uh, can can get the benefit of, uh, of Quillians. Uh, and you can create, so it, it summarizes, uh, uh, you know, scholarly content. Uh, it creates uh, uh, questions on uh, on the content and it creates multiple choice recall, short descriptive questions that automatically get, uh, get generated. So uh, uh, great reception uh, to that. Uh, it, uh, it offers uh, custom integrations with the ed tech platforms uh, and learning management systems. So the, the interesting thing about Quillians is it was developed originally several years ago using the uh, uh, the T two algorithm of ChatGPT. So we have been in uh, the pursuit of uh, use of AI uh, for a, for a very long time, and we find ourselves now uh, on the throes of uh, this this phenomenal uh, sort of excitement uh, that uh, uh, Gen AI and ChatGPT uh, in particular, and uh, the the latest uh, version, as, as I may have mentioned, of Quillians is based on uh, ChatGPT four. So. Uh, that that was really uh, what I came away with, that uh, uh, the excitement around the adoption, but doing it in a manner that does not disturb their sort of core responsibilities. Those are the sort of forces uh, at play uh, that I uh, sensed, Rahul. Thank you. Thank you, Avi. So, uh, so yeah, uh, I think uh, this is interesting that, you know, this assessment generation, uh, this AI-enabled assessment generation tool, Quillian's uh, is, is, has kind of shown a lot of, uh, sparked a lot of interest in faculties. Because typically, as faculties and educators, one of the things that we end up doing is we need a bunch of questions uh, for anything and everything that we do. And that takes a lot of thinking and time. It's not that, you know, you can just write questions and, you know, uh, just, just give it to the students to answers. Because as teachers, we feel responsible that we have to ask the right questions that kinds of reinforces the learning and all. So if AI can be leveraged to do this responsibly and help save time. So uh, this is very interesting. So yeah, uh, this is one. So of Raul, the... sort of, uh, before I, you mentioned Khan Academy. So Khan Academy uh, uh, is in Instructure's AI marketplace. And you will soon see Williams uh, along with Khan Academy in the AI marketplace uh, in Instructure. So we are already sort of getting uh, recognition for uh, uh, what this uh, this technology can do. So that that that's that's great. As I FII. <laughs> no, absolutely, that that is going to be wonderful because then what it, it's it's all about community. I believe in education. It's all about community, learning from each other, giving back to each other, and then within the marketplace, I think all the community users would be able to leverage all the different products and their advantages. This is becoming an interesting discussion, and I had anticipated this, that 60 minutes would be a short time for this kind of discussion. So <laughs> Insufficient, uh, yeah. we have a bunch of questions in the Q&A section. I think there are a couple of points that I wanted to discuss with Michael and Kim, and um, we would try and answer most of the questions. If in case there is any question that remains unanswered, we will definitely reach out to you via email and answer that. Or else you can reach out to us. You can reach out to any of the panelists if you want to have any specific conversation or discussion around anything. But yeah, please do keep those questions coming in. Uh, that's encouraging for us. Thank you. So Michael, uh, uh, there's also a lot of, you know, along with the advantages of AI, there's also a lot of buzz about, you know, the responsible AI part. 
So what are some of the things that, you know, we should be mindful while leveraging uh, generative AI as teaching community? What are some of those things? That yeah. yeah. Look, I, I think it's important to, to, to know that AI is going to help enhance and augment the teaching community's roles and responsibilities as it pertains to their, their roles, whether it's in K-12 or higher education. Um, I don't think it's going to actually replace the instructors, but what it's going to do is truly help uh, teachers get a better understanding of, you know, where, where might some of their student staff, uh, students be experiencing challenges and subsequently be able to help them. Usually what happens right now in the K-12 space is that teachers don't become aware of problems until they've become pretty severe. And AI is going to help uh, bring that, that uh, instructional staff to the attention of those students before it gets that, that severe. So I, th I think it's important to understand that it's not going to replace, but it's definitely going to augment and, and help uh, their roles and responsibilities as it pertains to teaching in K-12 and higher education. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. And thank you very much for reiterating the fact that, you know, it's not going to replace, but eventually it's going to augment and make things easier. So, Kim, uh, <clears throat> we would like to, you know, get some of your thoughts on uh, the research that you have done on or the conceptual de design that you have developed for a re-engineered education and training model that utilizes AI augmented adaptive learning. And this is more towards the personalized learning I know you have a couple of slides to share, so I can stop sharing my screen. Please feel free to bring All right, got that? Yes. I think what's really important to think about, we could have hours of conversation regarding this particular topic, but as you begin to implement these technologies seriously, what begins to dawn on you is that the one teacher, many students model, which we've been saddled with for almost 150 years. So think about what I just said, before electricity, in many cases, before indoor plumbing, right? Things have changed. And what we really understand is that we can turn that model upside down. Every learner now has access to numerous teachers. They have access to an AI that is giving them personalized attention. It's supporting their needs. It's identifying when they already know a topic and not forcing them to sit and wait until someone catches up with them. The whole system encapsulates and puts the learner at the center of the universe. Now, this is where you'll start thinking about this model and then realize it's missing some componentry. And so some of the research that uh, I've put together has been taking that upside down model and putting it in the center of the universe of a wide variety of other type of support services. Access the subject matter ed educational expert is a term I coined. I would like to see a world in which that learner, if they're getting into areas that are beyond the particular expertise of the human teachers that are engaged, that they have access to, to experts out there who can walk them through some pretty sophisticated stuff as necessary. I'm not going to go through every one of these boxes. The one in the upper right-hand corner, once again, I think it's the most important, the knowledge mapping. And what happens is after time, the system begins to once again develop a model of your, your desires, your interest, your knowledge level, your capacity, your propensities. And that box is the box that I think and I am predicting is going to be the box that will force the current education system to turn upside down and become learner centric because corporations and businesses and governments and NGOs and non-for-profits are going to want that box because that box really is the resume, right? It represents that person. So uh, we can talk about this at some other time, but uh, please, if, if any of this research is of interest to you, I'm keeping the most of what I can very public because I'm more interested in adoption than I am anything else at this point. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. I think the knowledge mapping part, of course, uh, you know, it just requires a separate detailed discussion altogether. Right. And, uh, you know, adoption is is kind of the, the key over there as well. So uh, moving ahead in our conversation, I think uh, 
we'll just uh, go around the room and 30 seconds uh, request to each panelist that if you could you know give us your concluding thoughts and comments in terms of role of generative ai in shaping the future of education avi we'll start with you We've lost him. At least. He's on mute. mute. Thank you, Rahul. And sorry for this. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, is now being seen is that from getting uh, scared or, or blocking uh, chat GPT to embracing it in, in a meaningful way is, is the journey that has been um, uh, traversed over a very short period of time. I mean, uh, you know, teachers in, in K-12 to uh, institutions are now asking students to use chat GPT and annotate those answers uh, instead of saying, don't use chat GPT. So they're figuring out a way to work with it. Uh, there's a Wharton uh, innovation challenge. And uh, uh, some years ago, I went uh, and attended the advanced management program at, at Wharton and one of those professors who was uh, quoted in yesterday's uh, Wall Street Journal uh, he uh, so the the challenge is to come up with uh, a brilliant idea uh, for fifty dollars or less, and uh, you know they had two hundred ideas generated by students, and they had Chat GPT generate uh, another two hundred, uh, and on an average uh, the uh, the Chat GPT ideas seem to get uh, better marks, but. Uh, you know, they came up with fun uh, ideas like uh, a collapsible laundry hamper, which I can see why, uh, you know, that would be interesting. A dorm room chef kit, an ergonomic cushion for hard classroom seats. I mean, I, I just love the, the creativity. Uh, I, I, you know, forget about the fact that it is practical or not. But uh, what they concluded was, and, and this is where I'm going with uh, with this, is that they think the human as the pilot and AI as the co-pilot is the model to go with, at least in the immediate future, because, uh, you know, the landscape is changing so fast and so quickly. We're getting brand new products, which, uh, you know, beat the previous versions uh, from, uh, you know, top five, top 10 companies. So uh, that's, that's where uh, I, I, I see the, uh, the new excitement is the uh, responsible uh, embracing of uh, Gen AI uh, in academic pursuits. Rahul. Thank you, Avi. Uh, Michael, your thoughts? Uh, I, I think the, the pandemic has truly brought AI um, to where it was a concept and idea to actual practical use. Um, and I'm, I'm endorsing it because it's truly going to help uh, individuals throughout their education journey be about them instead of just pushing them to the next stage, next grade, um, and sort of along that World War II factory assembly line, just move them along regardless of whether they're understanding the what they're supposed to be learning or not. Rahul. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Kim, your thoughts, please. Yeah, certainly. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut once said that the reason he enjoyed living on the edge is because he could see a lot further. And there you are. I think that's one of the reasons that uh, many of us uh, on this forum, including our, our panelists, I mean, our uh, uh, participants uh, are engaged in this because uh, my, my view is it, when someone says they need to think outside the box, you need to remind them there is no box. All boxes are, are constrained uh, and, and artificial inventions. And uh, I, I don't remember who made the point previously, but we're incredibly imaginative time in our uh, society. I envision a world in which education is re-engaged as part and parcel of our overall society. And so I don't use the word lifelong learning anymore or the phrase, uh, I just say learning because once these systems are engaged, imagine 10, 15, 20 years from now, learning will just be a matter of asking the what if, what about, and the system will wrap itself around you. I, I, I think these are remarkably interesting, exciting, and uh, will be good times. I 
truly believe that. I have to believe that. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, Avi. Thank you, Michael, for these closing comments. I think those were pretty interesting uh, uh, statements uh, that were made. So uh, once again, I thank uh, all the panelists for joining us for this discussion. We'll be moving to the Q&A section in a bit. Uh, briefly, I'll take a moment to uh, talk a little bit about Harbinger, who we are, what we do. So basically, uh, we have been founded in the year 1990, more than three decades of experience, a little over 850 plus employees. We would have developed 500 plus products, software products for our customers. Uh, we would have serviced 400 plus customers across industries, including human resources, e-learning, digital publishing, education, and high tech. And we are also big on gender diversity and inclusivity. And 43% of our workforce is women. And we are proud to say that 40% of our executive team is represented by women. So that's uh, briefly about Harbinger. And in the interest of time, uh, we'll just uh, move to the questions. So uh, I can see a bunch of questions in the Q&A section. So uh, I'll, I'll try and take this. So first one is simple. I think I'll take that uh, question. Will a recording of this lecture be available at a later date? Yes, uh, you'll get a recording of the uh, recorded lecture. And uh, so, and uh, Kim, next question, probably uh, if you have an answer for this, I'll try and uh, divert this to you. Do we have a new Bloom's taxonomy for the generative AI age? Is it out there yet or not? Not, not to my knowledge. Not yet. Okay. Great. Okay. Yeah. You're welcome to write one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is one question probably we should have discussed a little bit about this because, you know, leveraging JI is also all about, you know, uh, how good your prompt capabilities are. So how are we assessing their prompt capabilities? Is there a way to assess prompt capabilities? Uh, any Any thoughts on that from anyone in the panel? Or else we can we can take that later. Yeah. Okay. We'll we'll get back to you, Hadi, on this one. In terms of, you are absolutely right. I think uh, there's a term which has been coined as prompt engineering. Like there was a term like software engineering. Prompt engineering is a term. So you need to be you need to know what kind of questions uh, you need to ask. You need to have that thought process. This one question from Shaquille. It says, "I'm an official trainer for the foreign faculty in." Jazan University, Saudi Arabia. My question is that when professors are not interested to adapt the technology and doesn't become the friend of the technology, then how to convince them to use AI tools in teaching? Michael, you wanna talk a little bit about this? I'm sorry, what was the, what was the question again, Rahul? Yeah, so the question is basically when the professors or the teachers or the faculties are not interested to adapt the technology, Right, and, right. You know, then how do we convince them to use AI tools in teaching? Yeah, I, I, I think professional development is very, very important here. Um, we have teaching staff globally that I wouldn't say are resistant, but really are afraid of it. And I think through very um, interactive um, professional development, um, more times than not, you're going to get the you're going to get the instructional staff to adapt the technology. So I think that that's important. Right, absolutely. Uh, I think the professional development part that you mentioned for teachers with the shift in the technology happening, that's one key area that we should not overlook. This one question from- So Rahul, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, you'd asked about prompt engineering, uh, uh, but uh, I think more and more people are paying attention to how well are you querying the content? And that part is also getting assessed as much as the ability to understand and comprehend uh, you know, the, uh, the content per se. In fact, uh, at, at least in corporates, people are now uh, being assessed on the, uh, the smartness of the questions uh, that, they're, that they're asking. So that's, that's the new shift. I don't know if it answers the question, but I just wanted to comment on that. No, thank you. I, I think to yeah. a certain extent, uh, this kind of answers the question because if we have a system which in parallel can assess the way you're prompting or asking the questions and help you become more smarter, that will kind of, uh, you know, solve this uh, question. Absolutely. Let me, let me take this one. This looks a little interesting, Kim. I'll probably divert this to you. This is from Connie. Okay. 
how can we teach students the thinking skills to filter out the disinformation? So uh, critical thinking is critical, <laughs> <laughs> to be silly about it. Uh, I'm actually engaged in a project with a non-for-profit organization that is advocating the use of a series of media literacy tools uh, to be embedded in the AI itself at, at the very foundation that uh, will do its best to try to interpret the validity of the information that's being dished up. So we can do some things at the AI side to help facilitate people getting uh, at least the knowledge level of the accuracy of the information they're reading. And then definitely there needs to be a strong emphasis on critical thinking and media, li media literacy thinking uh, with every student uh, in the population because disinformation has kind of gotten away with murder uh, as we've witnessed in the last 10 years. And uh, that is, I think, probably one of the most important thinking skills that a, a learner can walk away with is critical thinking. So I, I kind of marry the two of those together. We, we need an AI solution. And then we also need um, the, the individual itself to be as skeptical as they, they need to be. Right. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, there's uh, just one last question we will take and then we will conclude for today. And uh, this one is from Sandra. So, and this is for someone like me, I guess, you know, a user like me taking the easiest route. So the question goes like this. Last semester, I had a ton of students at the university who just let chat GPT write their papers and speeches, even though if often did not meet the assignment specifications. In Kuwait, there's a culture of taking the easiest route and students flat out asked why they should bother learning to write a speech or an essay when ChatGPT or other programs can write it much better. And I'll open this to all the panelists if you want to share any of your thoughts that, you know, how we can kind of have a control mechanism sort of things or if there are already control mechanisms in place which kind of, you know, take care of these situations. So yeah, anyone can answer this question. Yeah, that we could, we, let's put up another hour seminar on that one. Um, <laughs> certainly. So, you know, what you're, what you're asking is really uh, the reason that individual is, needs to learn a particular learning objective. That, that's really at the core. And uh, many students don't understand uh, the correlation between the assignments and the core learning objectives. I, I think that's kind of endemic in a one teacher, multiple student uh, classroom environment. And uh, I'm not gonna say it will be fixed, but I think if you turn that model upside down, uh, the AI can then start uh, spoon feeding that individual. And um, you know, th there's a career pathing element to this too, right? Why do you need to be good at speeches? Well, at some point in your life, you're gonna find it remarkably valuable. So it, I'm wrestling with an answer because it, it it's bigger than what I think I can uh, do justice in just a, a sentence or two. But yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. My uh, answer would be that we will, uh, it's, it's always going to, new technology and approaches will emerge to deal with new disruptions and developments. Yep. It's, a, it's a race which is uh, ongoing and we ought not to be afraid of it. Uh, uh, unless, of course, there are some clear, clear red lines that we need to draw, and there are red lines that need to be drawn around uh, certain activities. But, uh, uh, you know, in, in their absence, uh, this, uh, this should be a fun battle, frankly. Uh, if I may, I'm going to I'm take yeah. another minute. Quick response to Jason. Jason asked, how do you see AI impacting areas of course development, such as instructional design and curriculum development? I encourage you to log into your AI and ask it to write you a course about anything. <laughs> ask it to do an outline form. So there I think are. that's my best answer there. Just go do it because you'll be dumbfounded. You go get a cup of coffee after a while and just think hard. <laughs> right, absolutely. So yeah, uh, I think, uh, thank you everyone in the audience uh, who have stayed with us. Uh, we are over time by, you know, probably five minutes, but uh, maybe we'll have to do a, you know, 2.0 of this discussion to address uh, some of the other points that we touched upon today. 
And again, let me take this opportunity to thank all the panelists for today for your wonderful insights and the audience for your contribution and the engagement for this webinar. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us or please feel free to reach out to the individual panelists. Thank you once again, and we wish you a good day ahead. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank Thanks you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.